Welcome to The Last American Vagabond. Joining me today is Vanessa Bealey to discuss what appears to be sort of the revitalization of the Syrian revolution kind of discussion, even though we've been told repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly from Trump and other people that the war was over, now it's back on and now it's over again, or any number of uh, narratives around Syria, when all of the evidence as far back as you could look has been pretty damn clear that this has been a you know, regime change effort. And even today that's on the surface, but now with a lot of other things in my, my opinion being that it's trying to cover up some other things that are hard to cover up today that we're seeing this kind of revitalization of the, of the Syrian destabilization discussion as it's the people fighting for freedom and that they're revolting against the bad guy Assad. And it's interesting how in almost all of these narratives today, COVID included, they're just kind of reverting right back to 10 years ago, like we don't even realize. So I'm happy to have Vanessa back on today to break this all down for us. How are you today, Vanessa? It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, it's good to be back on. And uh, it's, a, it's a very critical time, actually, in the war for Syria. Uh, it's a major escalation on a number of fronts, actually. And, you know, and that's one point that I think as much as I open with kind of like the facetious kind of perspective is that as no matter what, there are always people that are under the boot being, you know, suffering by, you know, on, on pretty much under most governments, all governments, as far as I'm concerned. But we can see that they because of the U.S. agenda that these people are continuing to suffer, as with so many other occupations. So what are you seeing in Syria that is, you know, kind of indicative of this kind of revitalization of this this movement, this agenda, as you see it? Well, I mean, the lead up, of course, we have to remember also that, uh, you know, America isn't doing too well in Ukraine. NATO isn't doing terribly well in Ukraine. Um, there are, I think, 14 months until the U.S. elections, as much as we know that, you know, they're a complete theatrical uh, event. Uh, still, they have some meaning for people in Syria if, if there is some change in direction. Obviously, Biden ramped up the aggression uh, very much so against Syria. Uh, he's been building up military presence in the Northeast. He's been basically reactivating ISIS proxies because, of course, people should know that ISIS is just another terrorist proxy of the United States. Cabal, the whole cabal uh, that is trying to destabilize and balkanize Syria. For, so real, ISIS real, real quick, for, for those who might push back on that in general, I just want to say, because that's such an important point that people, mm. if they haven't heard that before, might be kind of a taken back. Like We'll just <laughs> casually put that out. But I'm going to include <laughs> the Ben Swan documentary as well as James Corbett's three-part documentary on this, that it's just, it, there's no questioning what's going on here. This is a mm. U.S. proxy force in a general sense. They're sure there's peripheral parts of this that maybe aren't under complete control, but that's the reality. So go ahead. I just want to make mm. sure people know that, that that's not disputed by me and that's what the facts show. So go ahead. Yeah, and I mean, also, if people want to check out uh, John Kerry's uh, conversations in a closed session in the UN in September 2016, which were picked up actually, first of all, by the New York Times, surprisingly, um, and published in full, where he basically said that Obama administration considered ISIS to be leverage against the Syrian government, and that basically they were happy to allow ISIS to flourish if it put pressure on the Syrian government at that time. Of course, back then, the U.S. was still thinking, oh, this will all be over, you know, in a couple of months. They're never going to withstand, as it is now, almost 13 years of this aggression and some unprecedented, savage sanctions against the people, unilateral sanctions against the people. They're never against the named individuals or entities um, that the West claims that they are, uh, you know, imposing the regimes against. They always target the people mm -hmm. to ensure uh, the lack of dignity, the lack of resources, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of food, the lack of fuel, energy, etc., for for the people of the various countries that they're targeting. Um, so uh, yes, so effectively, the ISIS is another uh, U.S. proxy. Since the earthquake in February on February the sixth this year we've seen really uh, a ramping up of um, operations carried out by ISIS against civilians, against Syrian Arab army. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, there was an ISIS attack uh, in Deir Zor, which is to the east of the Euphrates, northeast. So in the territory, kind of the no man's land between Syrian Arab army and Russia and the US occupation via uh, the Kurdish separatists, the Kurdish contras that are also looking to create 
an autonomous region in the northeast, supported, of course, by none other than Victoria Newland, who's been making a lot of noise about how that, you know, how amazing this would be to carve off the northeast corner of Syria and turn it into the so-called autonomous region. Um, so all of this has been going on. We know that the U.S. forces are being brought in to effectively escalate confrontation between Russia and Syria and, of course, Iran and Hezbollah. Israel has been very busy targeting uh, military infrastructure, particularly air defense, trying to destroy Syria's air defense capability, but also trying to kind of target what they consider to be offensive weapon development in Syria. Unfortunately for Israel, the majority of this development is being done far underground. Mm. You know, the Syrians and the Iranians are not stupid. This development and this weapon development, defense and offense, um, is done in, in underground um, development areas. And so targeting by long-range missiles uh, for Israel is not effective. So there was a recent report actually put out by a university in Tel Aviv, um, and I've written about it at my substack. People can go and have a look. Um, talking about the threat from Syria, the strategic threat from Syria, so all of this kind of ties in because the messages being put out by Israel, the messaging being put out by the United States, which is becoming more and more belligerent towards Syria as the campaign in Ukraine fails, basically, despite everything that they're throwing at it. NATO is looking, you know, kind of ridiculous in Ukraine. However you perceive the conflict, Biden administration is losing and is basically being made to, to look like an idiot, although that's not terribly difficult because he doesn't do himself any favors. So, so basically what we have, I think, um, is an attempt by the Biden administration to get what they think will be a quick victory mm. in Syria. And so alongside uh, the attempts by the US in the Northeast to particularly secure the only safe crossing for uh, Syria, Iran, and Iraq at Al Bukamal, which is in the northeast on the border with Iraq. Israel regularly bombs humanitarian supplies mm. that come in. It is, of course, also a channel for, for weapons and so on to come into Syria completely legal. Syria is at war and its allies are helping. And the Al Bukamal crossing is one of the few remaining crossings that is open for Syria for any kind of relief to, to enter, particularly after the earthquake. But again, Israel uh, bombed the area as humanitarian relief was coming in from Iraq and Iran. So the US wants to secure uh, this border crossing because that will effectively close the entire eastern border with Jordan and Iraq with the US in control. But at the same time, what have they done? They've um, triggered, we'll talk more about the details, but they've triggered another 2011 peaceful protest revolution in the south amongst uh, the Sweda community, the Druze community. Now, if people don't know, Syria is made up of multiple sects and uh, faiths and religions. And, and, you know, one of the beauties of Syria is that it coexisted Christian with Yazidi, with Ismaili, with uh, Kurds, with, you know, but of course, what does the West always do, it, as it did in former Yugoslavia? It creates these, these sectarian statelets that are weak and can, the conflict can be maintained both within them and against neighboring states. Right. And, and historically, predominantly focusing on the Christian populations in these areas. As I understand it, Syria, before the invasion, was, the, I think, had the third largest Christian population in the Middle East. You know, these are just things that Americans, or in general, the West, don't consider or don't understand. We, they just oh, perceive yeah. it as a terrorist country because that's how the U.S. frames it, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important point. And, and also another important point is that the West wants to get the Christians out of the Middle East. Why? Because then that leaves a vacuum where it's easier for them to stir up sectarian right. uh, conflict between Muslim, Shia, Muslim, Sunni, Muslim, Alawite, etc., without the Christians being there as a kind of um, almost a buffer in a way, right? Mm 
Um, but the, the Druze sacks, just for people to understand, they, um, you will find them in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Israel. Um, they are effectively, they're, they're quite an interesting historic um, sect. They draw from a number of religions, including Islam, including Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. It's a really sort of interesting mix. It's a very conservative um, community. And basically, there are there is a minority within that community. The majority are um, for the territorial integrity of Syria and for um, the protection of the Syrian state. One of the greatest generals that fought the war against terrorism in Syria was from Sweda, General Zaradin, who was, who, who was uh, killed by his car driving over a mine after he'd liberated Deir Zor in the east from um, ISIS. So he, he's considered a hero in Syria. Um, but there is a small minority that is effectively controlled from Lebanon and Israel. In Lebanon, uh, the leadership is Walid Jumblat, who's a famous figure that has since 2011 been working against uh, the Syrian government and the Syrian presidency. And it's this minority which has now been triggered. But the important point is, it's, it's not only triggering this minority, it's what the West always does. So what has America done in preparation? It's moved 7,500 free Syrian army, so Muslim Brotherhood factions, from the north, from Turkish-occupied territory, to the U.S. illegal military base at al Tanef, which is in the southeast area on the border with Jordan and Iraq. So it's moved 7,500 terrorist militants down to this camp um, to train them and equip them. The plan, according to um, documentation that was released here in Syria, showing the plans of the West to a large degree, is that those 7,500 militants will be deployed to the border with Syria and Jordan, where they will maintain and control the crossing point. This is, of course, exactly what they did with Al-Qaeda mm. in the Northwest. The mm. crossing points there that allegedly bring in humanitarian aid are controlled entirely by Al-Qaeda or by Hayat Tari al-Sham, as it's now known, HTS, led by um, Abu Muhammad al-Julani, who, of course, was first with ISIS, then um, Al-Qaeda, and then he splintered that off into HTS. Mm. Um, and yes, you've just put uh, Rukban Camp up on the screen. Um, from Al Tanef, Rukban Camp is immediately to the south. And Rukban Camp is now known as, uh, I think this was Eva's article, right? Oh, this one, yes. Uh, no, this yeah. one, I believe, was, was Whitney's. Whitney's, yeah, Whitney Webb's. Oh, oh okay, fine. But I, Eva, Eva's um, covered it a lot as well. Yeah, I mean, she's you know. been, well, she's not been to the camp, but she's interviewed um, refugees that managed to leave and come back into, um, I think it was Homs. So basically, Rukban is another recruitment center for the U.S. to bring in um, militants and terrorists. So if you look uh, to the south, slightly to the west, you'll see uh, Sweda. Uh, and then to the east, again, Dada. Now, Dada, of course, was the start of the so-called revolution in 2011. It is still a very conflicted area. It's very controlled by armed groups, mafia, that basically when the area itself was kind of recaptured, first of all, really by Russia. Russia had control until from 2018 until 2021, really. And then Damascus in 2021, sent their own military to basically take control back from Russia. Um, but really, it's not, I won't say it's not been well handled, but, but the, the armed group splintered into so many kind of mafia factions, including those that are doing the majority of the drug smuggling um, now, that it's very difficult to control. And of course, a lot of the attention of the Syrian army and military is to the north, right? So the South has to, it's a huge country when you think of a military campaign. It's very difficult to keep control of every single sector. 
That's um, really quickly, if I could make a point for that in general, yeah. in the general sense, I think what people, that's, that's a really interesting point for people to understand how just because a group may be funding, arming, supporting a faction or not, the point is that you, that it, things can change and evolve and there'll be factions yeah. that break off. And, but the point is that that group is still responsible for the creation, arming and funding of that group, whether or not mm -hmm. they're still dictating their choices today. You know, that's one yeah. of the games that kind of get played, even going back to examples of Saudi Arabia sort of admitting that from their Wahhabist kind of mindset, that, like the groups they created were all kind of originated from this kind of creative point, but then don't, they don't necessarily have control of all of them today, but it's still mm -hmm. ultimately their responsibility. So I think that's an important point to understand because as you're saying, they just dump money and arms on anybody they might think will destabilize the area and then yeah. kind of stand back and act like we didn't do anything about that. And I just think that's important to understand. So go ahead. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I always say this, I, 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 when you take out the religious aspect, all of them, ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda, Al Al Sham, um, Jabhat al-Nusra, all of these groups uh, form their own mafia in a way. Mm. So I tend to see it, even though they are all kind of receiving funding from various different streams that are involved in this destabilization project, they have their own agendas and interests in relation to power, to status, to territory, to control, um, to money, very important. You know, these guys are mercenaries, basically. They're not fighting for any real ideological um, aim or agenda. That's a, really, that's a really important point as well for people. That, like as much as that's how it gets framed from the West, as you've covered a lot, like a lot of these groups are outwardly, like I think even also was admitted by the Saudi government as well to some degree that most of these kind of leadership factions of these larger groups aren't actually religious at all. It's more of a tool that's used to, that's a statement. I can't verify that, but that makes a lot of sense to me that it's just another tool being used and people fall into that. Yeah, I mean, um, probably the most purest, funnily enough, is ISIS that really does have this vision of a caliphate and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, but the other groups I would definitely perceive more as mercenaries. I mean, particularly the foreign groups like the Uzbekistanis, the, the, Turk the Turkmen's, um, the Chechens, the Uyghurs and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, OK, some of them do have an idea of creating some kind of caliphate inside Syria. But above and beyond that is, is their ability to earn money out of this, basically. Right. Right. They often see themselves taking advantage of what the West is doing. It's kind of like they both see themselves as taking advantage of each other because, I mean, you know, yeah. like in a general sense. And it, 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 as you said, it's not really about any aim or goal. It's really just about taking advantage of the situation as long as. Yeah, there, you, yes, it's, it's opportunism, basically. Yeah. And so what we're seeing now is basically opportunism, right? Because with the US power multiplying them and, and from a very close distance. So from TANF, um, the US already has military personnel there. It has a fairly big arsenal of weapons, including HIMARS, long range, ground-to-ground uh, uh, -ground missiles and so on. Israel often carries out attacks from El TANF because it perceives it as protected territory, even though it's Syrian territory. Um, Jordan is in on this plan again. Of course, it was in on the plan in 2011. And the idea is basically with this movement of Druze who are calling, the movement itself are calling for um, federalism, separatism, etc., autonomy. So they effectively are saying, like the Kurds, we want an autonomous region inside Syria. But of course, what's happening, and this is what the West is kind of hoping for, this will spread to Dara, for mm. example, and it already is. The, the Dara um, terrorist groups are already coming back together and supporting the movement in Sweden because they see it as an opportunity um, for, for the U.S. to come in and help them to annex this territory. Mm -hmm. right? So that's a whole swathe of territory in the south. And also you have to bring in Israel because Israel has been targeting the Sweda faction since well, for decades, actually, because along with the Golan uh, territory, it perceives as sort of absolutely optimum for them to, to have control of the territory, um, kind of Sweda, Dara, and South. Mm -hmm. So for Israel also, this is, this is a perfect opportunity. Is now, the other thing, sorry, go on. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm just going to ask, is that because of, is it like higher ground as well as the water resources is that the whole general area right there? I know that's the Golan Heights part of it, but is that more strategic? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the Golan Heights, many people don't know this. They tend to think about oil resources, but actually the Golan Heights provides Israel with 30% of its water right. supply. Um, the territory in Sweda is kind of interesting. It's tactically um, quite good, but from Sweda to, to Tana, for example, it's very treacherous territory. I've been there um, when the... Um, ISIS attack took place against the eastern Sweda villages in Sweda city in 2018, and a number of women and children were kidnapped, and they were taken into the Badia, into the desert between Sweda and Altana. It's volcanic lava desert. It's the most bizarre. It's like a kind of lunar landscape. It's very treacherous. It's very hard to, to, to walk on um, or to travel across. But of course, it's also perfect for hiding terrorists in the caves and the holes mm. in between the, the lava. They're very difficult to see and they're very difficult to fight against, right? Um, and in Sweda, there is high territory. And again, a lot of rocky territory with caves and so on. So to, to a large degree, from a fighting perspective, it's good territory to have hold of because it's very difficult to, to attack, basically, as is any high ground, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Oh no, I, I was just going to say before we get any further into the details of this, just one yeah. quick, a quick question for you because I this this is it's really interesting the kind of how this is all coming back up again. But what do you think the again your your opinion based on what you see happening is this just about trying to you know, is this all about Russia or is this about Israel's engagement in regard to the Iranian issue in Syria? Is it all together? Like, because you mentioned Ukraine, I think that's easily, mm -hmm. or even the election with Biden, the easy win for Syria. Like, this is multifaceted. You know, what do you see as the primary reasoning of recreating this kind of false revolution? Well, it's kind of interesting that a lot of the tweets that are being put out also have on their profile Slava, Ukraine, mm. etc. So there is a definite connect. And a lot of the rhetoric is, is not only against the Syrian government, but also against Nazi Russians, right. which is very uh, reminiscent, of course, of the Ukrainian, you know, um, Russian orcs and so on. Yeah. So it's, there is definitely a connect. Yes. And this is definitely against Russia. From Israel's perspective, of course, it's against uh, Iran and Hezbollah. Um, and against the Iranian presence and, as I said, weapon and defense development uh, in Syria mm -hmm. in collaboration with Iran, because it's predominantly Iran. North Korea also plays a part, interestingly. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but more from a point of view of technology. But Iran is, is really playing a hands-on part in preparing Syria for the potential mm -hmm. of heightened escalation with Israel. Right? Which clearly seems to be happening. I think that the Druze part of this we've talked about in the past a couple times, actually, it's interesting, specifically from Lebanon's perspective, that this seems to be, I would predict, based on your work and others, that that's something we're going to see rise up in Lebanon, just like it's happening in Syria. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to Marwa Osman about this the other day, because we've been talking about the situation here. And as she pointed out, you know, British intelligence, um, U.S. intelligence, but to a lesser extent, this is a British project in Lebanon. Mm. They've been developing, um, for example, the Palestinian camps, which are predominantly Muslim Brotherhood in Tripoli in the north, mm. um, but also in the various other Palestinian camps. And as Marwa pointed out, you know, in one camp alone in Beirut, there's probably 250,000 radicalized wow. um, militants or potential militants. And that's without looking at Tripoli or some of the southern uh, camps, for example, that are, we're, we're seeing um, explosions of um, conflicts in, I can't remember the, I, I can't remember the name of the camp, but it's at Sidon port uh, in the south, mm -hmm. where there have been Islamist factions um, fighting against Fatah factions inside the camp. And there have been quite a high number of uh, casualties there. So in Lebanon, we are seeing kind of obviously not the start. We're seeing an increase in, in kind of sectarian provocations, for example. Mm. So there is potential, yes, for Lebanon to get pulled into this. 
Um, that would just suggest to me that this is obviously much bigger than one territorial issue. Oh, right? yeah. The budding of something yeah. much larger, hopefully not something as large as we might be able to envision. Like it, it begins to feel that way, though, right? With the multi front yeah. wars, it's all you, you're seeing these very clear sides divide, you know, Iran, Russia, China. It's, it's very concerning because as much as I don't like to fear monger about the bigger worries of nuclear war and things like that, this it's hard not to see that kind of creeping in with these kind of alignments. Well, it is when you look at what the U.S. is doing. I mean, you know, um, when you have U.N. officials actually denying U.S. military presence <laughs> in Syria, as they did a couple of That's months right. ago. That was terrible. <laughs> you know, um, but the thing is that Al-Tanif, again, they've, they've not only got this 7,500 terrorists from the north, but they've also brought in 16,000 um, Jews to be trained up, 3,500 are supposed to be released back into uh, the Sueda area to effectively replace the existing governmental security agencies, police force, etc. So this is clearly like a move to create a shadow state within Sueda itself. We know or, or we believe from um, uh, reports that have been made here in Syria that this is being backed again by Qatar. And it's interesting that Qatar was the one country that didn't come forward to normalize with Syria when mm. Saudi Arabia and UAE, et cetera, and when you know, President Assad was invited to the Arab League summit a couple of months back, Qatar very much kept in the background. Also, simultaneously, so these meetings took place in Paris um, between uh, British and French officials and the leadership of one of the movements um, in Sweden. Uh, a certain amount of money, they're saying 200,000 was given to the leadership to start kind of um, presenting themselves as the savior of the people in this area. Because of course, everyone is suffering from electricity blackouts, energy deprivation, um, rising food prices, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and the government is struggling to deal with it. I mean, this is normal. 12, 13 years of war, um, continuously, you know, increasing sanctions, even sanctions on countries that might want to come to the assistance of Syria and invest and, and help them to rise up. They will actually be sanctioned, right? Which shows um, you the war on the people of Syria, as you've mentioned yeah. many times, right? You, you mentioned before in your report with the UK, uh, UK column, that they essentially had stopped Russian aid from coming, arguably because yeah. they wanted to be the ones to be the heroes of the moment. But either way, hurting the people they claim to be fighting for. Can you speak on yeah. that? I think that's it's very telling. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is the Western ploy again and again. It's, it's to reduce the people to such a level of desperation that the US can then come in either directly or through proxy and provide them everything they didn't have for, for five years, right? Mm. And so, of course, you know, you have to be incredibly strong to resist that. If someone's coming to your house and saying, hey, you know, we'll give you running water 24-7, we'll give you electricity 24-7. And of course, with Jordan right on the border, this is a possibility. That's what they've done in the Northeast. The Kurds have everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> including the oil that they steal from Syria and the agricultural produce exactly. that they steal from Syria. But they have everything. They have cars. They have fuel. They have money. They have, you know, they have a good life. Um, yeah, which, which and and when you compare that to the right. misery that people are living under in Syria, it's, it's, it's a huge temptation. And the West know that. Mm -hmm. They know it. That's what they do. That's why they put sanctions on. It's to yep. create this, this level of desperation so they can either manipulate it or they can turn it against the government again. And that's always yeah. a point worth making sure people understand is that the, the sanctions are aimed at the civilian population so that they're so desperate that they just don't care. Like you just demonstrated, they don't they even most of these people are aware of what's being done to them, but will still take the help because their children are starving. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's very simple how that works out. And it's <laughs> disgusting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really horrible. And this um, image that you're putting up now was in Sweden a couple of days ago. And you can actually see the armed militants there at the protest. So we are literally going back to 2011. The interesting thing, and I have to keep repeating this, um, because actually Mike on UK column asked an interesting question. He said, but you know, how can people fall for this again? And I said, but you have to understand the West's MO. 
So they will take a minority that are already marginalized or are already in opposition to the government that they are trying to, to destroy. Right. They take and, an organic base that they really, yes, they believe, right. Yes. And then they will power multiply it with their own terrorist forces, right? So now you have this incredible, horrible situation where the people of Sweden, this minority, are actually allying themselves with ISIS, with Al-Qaeda, with Muslim Brotherhood, with the very people that murdered their own people back in 2018. This is how sick this entire situation is, right? But of course, this is, this is the West's psychology or psychopathy, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I tend right. to call it all the time these days. And so then the plan is basically of these, uh, so they have 16,000 Druze that they're training um, in weapons. There is also the potential, of course, that they will release snipers to target civilians and then blame on uh, Syrian security because the military isn't really in this area. The Syrian Arab army has deliberately kind of left it to them to manage so as not to, um, to, to increase the conflict in these areas. You Which know, that has always, yeah, that's always been the deal with Sweda in particular. Sweda actually has kind of been given special treatment. That's why it's, it's actually so galling for many Syrians who've really gone through the war and really suffered the war. Sweda, to a large degree, was given preferential treatment because of the risk of this kind of movement. So, for example, their sons uh, were not forced into conscription, as any other country at war uh, would do, right? But th they were given kind of um, alleviation from this to a large degree. They actually have better electricity and water supply than many other areas in Syria. So actually, this is, this is kind of what sticks in the throat of many Syrians in Damascus and in central Syria um, who have really endured the hardship. And now they're saying, well, you know, how can you be rising up when actually you've had a better life than any of us to a large degree? Right, right. right. Well, so, I mean, this speaks to the, I mean, again, that there seems to almost always be some level of group that, like in Iran or, or any number of places, Venezuela, Bolivia, you can always find some organic pushback that always exists in yeah. the country and that they take advantage of that. And I mean, I hope people didn't miss that point there. This You're, you're saying that it is a minority that is being fleshed out yeah. with fake real people, but, a, you know, the fake protest to make it look like mm. the majority, which then gets points at by corporate media. And they say the rev the revolution of the people and they back that in general. Right. And it's, that's a very yeah. important thing. And they, that's, that's easy to do. Right. So mm. I, I, I do agree. His point is interesting because you, even the minority of people that are still protesting, do you think they're again, your opinion, but do you think they're unaware that they're being supported by these radicals or do you think they just don't care because they just are so motivated and they're happy to have support? You know, how do you see that? I think they don't care. Mm -hmm. I, I think like any of these factions, like the Kurds that are working with ISIS, um, you know, Al-Qaeda, I don't think they care as long as it's achieving their goals. Mm -hmm. And this minority, their goal is separatism. Their goal is autonomy. And their goal is toppling President Assad, or at least having their own president. And that's right? something that the U.S. government or the West will support no matter what this group is about. And we've seen yeah. that all around the world. And there's examples we might even yeah. get into today that I think are historic. You know, well, I mean, on, that's on that note. Since and let's let's uh, give, give me some of your examples after this about you know what we're seeing and why you think this is building and you know like we saw with the images. But I want to bring up the uh, some of the points that I was just talking about in, in mm. a previous show that I thought were really interesting. So this is from August 18th from uh, aswat.com. I wasn't very familiar with the platform, but basically just saying mm. that they're seeing military movements in Iraq, but that as they see it, it's more about action in, in particular it simply says the americans will try to cut off the iranian supply route towards syria and lebanon and oh actually it's right here um where was it right here saying the leader of the uh, noted that the armed factions believe the strategic objective of these moves one is for an operation outside of iraq but to literally quote change the rules of engagement with the russians in syria so it's exactly yeah. what you're highlighting so i found that really interesting and then yeah. we have moon of alabama pointing out that the U.S. are they're sanctioning the moderate rebels that they literally created, armed, funded, and they wouldn't exist without this, the Hamza division being for, for, forefront of that. And it's just it's interesting that that's even happening at the same time with the U.S. military training and working with the PKK YPG with, that Turkey sees as terrorists. So it's all very fascinating to me. So how does that fit in to what's going on here? 
Well, basically, the groups that are being sanctioned, this is a message to Erdogan. Erdogan. Mm, that's um, interesting. Right, because these groups are basically under Turkish control now in the north. So what this is, it's, it's two, two things. So it's a message from the U.S. to Erdogan, but it's also a support of Jelani, because Jelani, who heads up HTS, is, of course, the U.S. preferred opposition in um, Idlib, in the northwest. And that's high and we know um, that's, that's the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, just so people know. Yeah, that's, yeah okay. Yeah, he has a 10 million bounty on his head, but, you know, don't worry about that, from the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a prescribed um, terrorist group by the U.K., even by Turkey, I think, and by the U.S., but, you know, hey, never mind. But if you remember, it was Martin Smith of PBS that interviewed um, Jelani and kind of brushed his beard and put him in a suit, but he's still a terrorist. And um, more recently, in May of this year, France 24 um, journalists went into Idlib and did an interview with Jelani, again, normalizing a terrorist group to present them as um, legitimate Sorry, the cats are fighting. Okay. <laughs> As um, legitimate opposition um, to the Syrian government. It's and just... people should know, you know, like there were many stories, I think we talked about this after the earthquake, mm -hmm. when um, the Syrian government was actually trying to send aid to people in the Northwest, and it was Jelani that was preventing it. And he wanted 10,000 per lorry to enter Idlib. But he also used it as a kind of marketing ploy in the sense that he said, we will not normalize the Syrian government. You know, we consider ourselves to be independent and, and legitimate opposition. And for this reason, they've created uh, uh, the, the, what's it called? God, the national, the, the, the salvation government, mm. but it's still HTS. It's like the white helmets. They just put on a white helmet and then they become politicians rather than terrorists, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it was two pronged, basically, these sanctions. It was a message to Erdogan and it was um, uh, kind of promoting Jelani. It was helping Jelani because there are battles or, that have been going on for some time where Jelani is trying to either bring other mafia terrorist groups under his umbrella, or if they're not playing ball, then he's wiping them out hmm. with the help of the US, of course, because Jelani and his henchmen call in the strikes, the assassination strikes, particularly of groups like Karas al Din, um, who are in direct opposition to Jelani. So Jelani you know, gives a call to the CIA, the CIA send out their drones and Jelani gives them the coordinates and boom, you know, the leadership is gone. So it's, it's a really, it's, it's such a dirty war, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is who's at the root of it? <laughs> the US cartel. And right. I'm not, you know, not only the US, mm -hmm. of course, all mm -hmm. of the, the alliance, including the UK, EU, particularly France, of course, um, Israel, um, Qatar, and before, of course, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Turkey, you know. The Turkey part of this is so interesting to me. It's just Turkey's a NATO mm -hmm. ally, and Erdogan has always played this really interesting role where he just seems to do whatever he wants and it's not like <laughs> no side seems to care. It's very strange. And I, I think my, I guess my guess would be at least in this current context that again, the Western agenda specifically in my mind, the U S is okay with what, you know, whether he's working with groups they don't agree with. And I, again, I don't think they morally care what group they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, as long as he's in Syria, occupying territory, destabilizing, you know, making it harder for Assad and Syria's government to take back their own territory. But I think as this develops, you know, whether it's Turkey in regard to these groups, if they somehow get in line or, or, or Israel with what's going on with the Druze population, that all of this very clearly is building in regard to, if you see it in the context of what's going on with Ukraine and the larger proxy war against Russia, because all of these are, all these factions are, it's, it's, I don't know how Russia wouldn't see it that way. Let me put it that way. So how do you see that? Because Russia clearly is going to take this as kind of an, 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 an specifically with Syria, an increase in regard to their dynamic with the U.S. and the West. And so that seems like a very dangerous step. And go ahead. Yeah. And I mean, we have seen an increase in provocations by the U.S. Mm -hmm. There have been, I think, in um, July, more than 340 close shaves with uh, American drones and aircraft coming in very close vicinity to Russian planes in Syrian airspace. Mm 
Um, yeah. Russia has also been seriously intensifying its bombing campaign, both in the northwest, but also interestingly in and around Altanev, because Panev, uh, people won't know this, but it has a 55 kilometer exclusion zone established by the US um, around the camp on Syrian territory. So Syria, Russia, Iran, none of these um, entities can enter this area. And so in that area, it's been incubating, training, arming, equipping, preparing terrorist groups for whatever is happening now, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Russia has, in the last um, couple of months, it's been intensively bombing these areas, right? So in my opinion, and having spoken to a number of my contacts, both here, Russian contacts, both here and in Moscow, they kind of expected this to happen. Mm. They knew that the potential was very high that this would come. Iran was expecting the closure or the attempt to close down al Bukamal. It's not going to happen. You know, Iran is pretty prepared for this because al Bukamal is its primary entry point into Syria. And of course, it's, it's um, the, the road route from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, eventually to Palestine. So for Iran, um, it's absolutely essential that they maintain al Bukamal. And people should also know Bukamal is um, protected by Syrian army, but also by the PMU forces, mm -hmm. the popular mobilization front um, in Iraq, which is claimed to be an Iranian proxy. It isn't really. Mm -hmm. It's an Iraqi militia made up of Christians, Sunni, um, actually all sects and communities from inside Iraq. And it was responsible for fighting ISIS in Iraq. Right. right? So Bukamal is protected by the PMU and the Syrian army. So, I mean, yeah. America is going to have a huge fight on its hands. And, and Syria has been preparing for this also. It knows that this is um, the agenda of the U.S. in the northeast. See, bringing um, this back. Oh, go ahead. Mm, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go on. I just if you have another point, please continue. But I was going to no, say, bring no, no. it back to uh, the, the original kind of idea about this, you know, whether this is, you know, an act of desperation, you know, get a quick win in Syria, which I highly doubt is something that's going to happen. But yeah. that ultimately, this does feel like something that is connected to the failure that was, that's going on in the Ukrainian proxy yeah. war. And I think that is always seemed like something much bigger to me than just a fight for the Ukrainian territory. Right. I think that's very clear. So how, do, how do you see this tying in with this in regard to what's going on there? We see, and let's get into that part of it, the overlap, the different accounts that are promoting this very same false revolution that are saying mm. Slava Ukraine and Russian mm. Nazis. And it's just really hard not to see that. So how do you think, if this was directly connected to the Ukrainian proxy war, how does that make sense? Explain, you know, the Syrian overlap and what are they trying to accomplish there as you see it? Well, I think you have to um, look at how the U.S. is using its proxies as not being isolated to one area or one region or one continent. Um, and I think you also have to bring Africa into this. Mm. Um so, for example, since the beginning of the operation in Ukraine uh, in February 2022, we've had ISIS fighters going to Ukraine. We've had um, Turkish proxy fighters going to Ukraine. We've had British and foreign mercenaries and probably intelligence um, operatives that were fighting with the Kurdish separatists in the northeast going to Ukraine and establishing brigades there. Mesa Gifford is one of those. Um, and actually a, a, hard, a, a big number of the British mercenaries, uh, I've forgotten the name of the guy that was actually captured, but he was in the northeast fighting right. alongside um, uh, the Kurdish separatists. So already there was a big connection. And, and I would say it, it centrally goes back, of course, to the US, UK, EU um, alliance, right? Mm -hmm. To the NATO alliance, really. And then if you look at Africa, of course, what have they been incubating there? Um, Al Qaeda, ISIS, um, Boko Haram, that's just another derivative of ISIS and Al Qaeda in Nigeria, in order to um, destabilize the continent and to prevent Russia and Chinese. Um, development there basically mm 
or as they perceive it, of course, the, the you know the the seizing of their imperialist spoils. Right. God the forbid they make right. agreements with people as opposed to just strong arming. You know what happens? Yeah. But, What's interesting, though, is, you know, we've seen Niger, we've seen a lot of these different, you know, a lot. I mean, I, I, I was just trying to find the article. I can't I did, couldn't pull it up quickly, but I saw a report from the statesman about 15 different, you know, basic coups that you can tie directly back to U.S. personnel on the ground there, which is nobody would bat an eye at. Like, clearly <laughs> see that happening. And so, it's yeah. it, you know, it's it's again, it's just it's hard to see this as kind of one big playing field. And it, the way you just described it before, basically sounds like this Ukraine hotspot is like this dumping ground for all the worst extremists of all the different groups. And Russia seems to be fighting that war. <laughs> that's but not also, even a good guy, bad guy, but that's hard not to see. Go ahead. But you've also got, to, I, when you said dumping ground, I agree completely, but also look at it, that it's a weapon hub. Mm -hmm. Both right? biological, chemical, and yeah. Definitely. Everything is going into Ukraine. And mm. from Ukraine, it's going to Sahel, it's going to Syria, um, it's probably going to Libya. It's, it's, it's being kind of fanned out into all of these conflict zones, right? Mm. Yeah, that's so, terrifying. So for me, it's, it's like you have to look at it as a much bigger map of, of a global conflict. Right, right. And, you know, whether, whether you, whatever your opinion is of Russia or China, um, the way that they conduct themselves towards sovereign nations is completely different to mm -hmm. how the U.S. does it. The result long term may be the same. I can't draw that kind of conclusion right yeah. now because in Syria, Russia is what is, you know, keeping Syria alive to a large degree, Russia and Iran and, and Hezbollah. So, but, but largely Russia from, because they have the, the air power here. Mm -hmm. And also the naval, um, because the, the attacks on ISIS after the various massacres of civilians and army came from a Russian navy at the port of Tartus who fired uh, cruise missiles at uh, ISIS positions in the northeast. Mm -hmm. And this was an important message also to uh, the U.S. that if you want to, you know, if you want to escalate this, we're ready. Mm -hmm. Because that's the first time, I think only one other time they did this. Um, and again, targeting ISIS. But this, this was two or three attacks from uh, the Navy at Tartus targeting ISIS positions in the Northeast, very close to, to American bases. So, you that... know, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating, but at the other hand, it's horrifying. It's, right, and it being is. here, it's horrifying because... If this plan succeeds and they manage to annex more territory, what does that do? That, that puts Israel and the U.S. literally only 100 kilometers from Damascus, which means it's easy to target with ground-to-ground -ground missiles. They don't need air force. They don't need long range, right? So, so it, it, it becomes kind of scary at that point if, if you, you know, think ahead. People here are worried. I mean, I mean, people, you know, who are making decisions are worried. Yeah. Well, you know, it, I think obviously, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, that I think Syria has always been, I mean, going back to the 70s and, and, and Brzezinski, like mm. the, the whole discussion is well, Syria was always a very important geostrategic control point, right? We talked about the, the, the land bridges and these kind of conversational points. And so that makes mm. sense to me why that would be a focus in a general sense. But I guess what I have trouble wrapping my mind around, and I'm wondering if this is, tied to some bigger thing you know any number of things why all of this would be centered on russia it, it you know arguably that wouldn't even i mean I, why do you think that would make sense because china is a dynamic and all this like it seems like all of these forces and efforts are being marshaled into something that appears to be aimed at russia but I, does that doesn't really make sense to me so what do you think that's is that really what it's about in your opinion yeah i mean i i do think it is i think china China for me is a slightly different entity. It's not a culture or a civilization that I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling with China, it's a little bit more mercenary in its policy. China will look after China, right? Um, so to a large extent, of course, there is a looming war with China also. I mean, they are building up in Taiwan and in, you know, and in, in, uh, from a naval perspective, um, but I think also Iran 
um, is a target here. I mean, the fact that they are now moving, I think, aircraft carriers um, into the seas in the Middle East, that's, that's, you know, as soon as they move aircraft carriers in, as a friend of mine said, that, that's a clear sign that, that conflict is expected. Right. Um, I mean, the U.S. just recently moved, a bu- or is, it, is in the process of moving ships in regard to the Strait of Hormuz, which is always a big yeah. central point of this because, you know, Iran threatens to shut it down. That's important for oil and so on. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I definitely see the moves taking place that are indicative of some bigger action about to take place. And I, I guess I would understand that Russia, at the very least, whether it's a bigger dynamic that, that weakening Russia and keeping them mired in a long term engagement mm-hmm. would make sense because you're weakening the, the coalition and so on. That would make sense to me. Well, also the balkanization of Russia, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's a long-term plan. And because I think, I mean, if you read the Grand Chessboard, Brzezinski, which I'm sure you have, um, you know, it, it's very much they perceive Russia um, to be the greater threat mm. to a large degree, maybe because existentially, um, culturally, yeah. Russia rejects so much of uh, Western policy, Western ideology, and it and it's it has a very powerful um, religious base. I mean, that's one of the reasons that Russia came into Syria, of course, was to protect the Orthodox Christianity, Christian communities here. And and just if I could add to that really quickly, that's actually an interesting mm-hmm. thought because we China overlapping with the west is a very it doesn't it's there's not much overlap ultimately there's there yeah. but, but you can see from a russian perspective like just taking this from a u.s government center kind of perspective russia culturally culturally is threatening to a lot of what's mm. happening in the united states so that that actually makes a lot more sense to me because they would be more of the group that would at least present themselves as you know look at us we're not you know not to get this in other topics but you know the trans agenda <laughs> different things you know and so yeah. I, that actually makes a lot of sense to me now that we've fleshed that out a little bit so that's interesting yeah i i think it's very much about um you know there are people within russia of course there are people within china there are people within every nation in the world that are aligned in one way or other with the corporatocracy mm. in the west for sure but i speak to foreign office officials um, who know exactly what the West is trying to achieve. And they are completely opposed to, um, you know, trans- the transgender um, movement, um, vaccines, COVID, everything. They're totally on board with everything that we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. And that's very much the same here. And, and that's where I always struggle with kind of saying, point blank, they're in on it, they're, they're all bad guys, they're all involved in it. No, because yeah, there are simple. elements, mm-hmm. as there are in Britain and France and Germany and so on, some that are with it and some that are against it and some that are just too frightened to stand up and fight against it, right? right. Um, but I think for, from a cultural perspective, Russia is naturally against it. I mean, when you talk, for example, about um, what is it, the, the medically assisted suicide in Canada, which I've written about at length. Yeah. Um, Russia point blank it, in its constitution, it refuses euthanasia, right? Mm. For them, for, for Russia, it's horrifying that it this would be considered. It is horrifying. It's crazy. Uh, you know, and that's the thing. The West is ideologically so opposed um, to Russia. And it's a bit like, you know, the West is, is promulgating these narratives that Russia is stealing children and putting them in child, children farms and so on. I visited these children farms in the east of Russia when I went there. They are so well taken care of and they can go back as soon as their homes are rebuilt in Mariupol, for example, they, they can go back. But they are given everything from psychological trauma therapy um, to three meals a day, bus tickets so they can go into town with their parents and so on, education, everything is, is, is prepared for them. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, you have children being trafficked for organs, you have right. children being trafficked for prostitution, you have children disappearing in Europe. Ukraine has always been the main harvesting hub for all right. of these incredibly nefarious, insidious operations and before before february 2022 yeah. just like everything else they were all writing about that between poland and ukraine and, exactly. and then suddenly they all just forget, and then suddenly know. it disappears <laughs> yeah well I, I have i have two 
I have two things to ask you before we wrap up oh. here in, in, in regard to Russia as well and, and in, in anything else you want to include. But so it, do you, first of all, do you think if this goes forward, like it clearly seems that it is, do you think that Russia will do something like historically throughout this process? And I give them a lot of credit for this showing restraint at times when there's clearly no benefit to just belligerently responding like we might expect oh. the U.S. military to. But nonetheless, there's been a lot of people that criticize them. You know, why don't you do something? Why don't you stop Israel from bombing Syria, you know, or, or at least, you know, try to get in the way and so on. Do you think if this begins again, do you think that, this, that Russia or other factions involved in Iran will step in and do something about it? Or, or just first that, do you think that they'll act before this becomes something more intense like it was before? Just your opinion. I think a very important point to make for people because they tend to forget this point when they're saying why doesn't Russia do something why doesn't mm -hmm. Iran do something why doesn't someone else do something all of these countries unlike the US and I think that's why people tend to project their understanding of what these kind of relationships between countries mean because based on the US you know modus operandi right mm -hmm. but all of these countries from Russia to Iran especially Hezbollah respect the sovereignty of Syria. Right. So every decision comes from Damascus. For example, Iran would have happily, I know this from speaking to people there, would have happily responded to Israel before now. Mm -hmm. But it's Damascus that is saying, no, we're not ready. Right? The yeah. same with Russia. Russia isn't going to um, lead a campaign against anyone without Damascus's green light. So this is a very important point. So when people say, why doesn't Russia do something? Why doesn't Iran do something? It's because Damascus doesn't want to do something right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, that is a very important point because it shows you, you know, the, like I, what you're, one of the, what you said there essentially is that the U S government in this reverse situation would act like it's their moral imperative yeah. and just do it without asking and, yeah. and then frame that as a positive thing. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, but I guess, yeah. I, you know, but let's just say in the context of Syria allowing it and so on, you know, I think, yeah, yeah. That, which brings me to the final kind of point in general would be that, you know, not to be a, a pessimist, but I, I think that it's kind of almost a, an impossibility for, you know, as you said, the U.S. is already in al and they already have these different locations within Syria and they've already been building this entity. So it seems like this is going to happen. So mm. what what do you what do you predict being the response to that? That's, you know, that's kind of where I go with that, because I find it hard to believe that Syria or and then with that Syria's allowance that Russia or anybody else wouldn't react knowing what is planned and what has already happened, you know, f false chemical attacks and so on. I mean, I think right now they're in a, obviously a very delicate situation. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that they still have kind of a window of opportunity to try and defuse it, mm -hmm. I hope. And they're trying to. Um, using the majority, for example, of the religious leaders um, in the Sueda area to try and talk down the other groups that are being uh, propelled by the U.S. to, to kind of um, inflame this whole movement. Um, so I think that will be a first step. If the U.S. escalates it to the point where the majority of those posing a threat are terrorist entities, then the game might change, mm. right? Yeah. But right now, they, they are trying to find ways to negotiate it down. That's so It's very difficult because the U.S. is, you know, at the same time, Syria, it, it's committed to the north right now. Mm -hmm. um, it can't be seen, of course, to be dropping barrel bombs <laughs> on um, another kind of peaceful protest, although we know it's not peaceful. Mm -hmm. in the south because already for example the uk um un envoy or representative the german special envoy to syria is already they're already starting to up the rhetoric about resolution 2254 and changing the constitution and 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 so they're seeing the opportunity they're not coming out with regime change regime change um that's never left example, the table <laughs> exactly so you know it's it's a very i guess it's we're at a very difficult mm -hmm. juncture at the moment as to whether it will ignite or whether it will settle back down again yeah um, well, I, yeah no, i'm just gonna say that of course it's all speculation at this point you know so yeah. we can only hope that it does not get worse for people that have already been suffering you know a near decade and a half long 
yeah. regime change campaign. But I, you made an excellent point to end with there that it's, again, another another contrast to the freedom fighters versus whatever else that ultimately, at least in your perspective, it's about at least trying to defuse this. Even though it's yeah. very obvious that there's no honesty in what's happening here, still mm -hmm. willing to try to go, let's just not let this happen because people will suffer. Whereas yeah. in reverse, pretty much anywhere you look in, in a Western kind of foreign policy engagement, if something, if you, if they get poked in the eye, it's then we're going to stab your, whatever analogy you want to use. We're going to go above and beyond and fight back as opposed to just going, well, let's just try to solve this for the people, you know? And I think yeah. that's it's such an interesting point to think about, you know? Mm. Well, thank you for, as always, for breaking this stuff down because you, as you well know, there's so much going on and, and even myself uh -huh. get pulled into, you know, like I just did this whole show about what's going on with all the COVID information and so much falls by the wayside. So anytime, mm. you know, I'd love having you on to break this stuff down. Anything else you want to leave people with, future work you're coming up with or anything like that? No, I mean, the only thing I would like to say is, you know, what this is really is a preparation for people in case there is going to be a propaganda hype on mm -hmm. it, right, to, to question. I know that you always say, you know, question, question, and question more. We, we all say it all the time. But I'm trying to lay the ground so that people understand if this does escalate, that the media is going to be picking it up and it's going to be all about freedom movements and autonomy and the dreadful government and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to kind of give people the ammunition to, to push back against it if it happens basically, but people can follow me at Substack. I'm trying to do fairly regular um, updates on the military situation in Syria um, at my Substack, um, And that's the best place really to, to follow me. Awesome. Yeah, we'll make sure to include that, your Twitter and, and any other information we talked about yeah. today. So everyone can check this stuff out for themselves. And 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 as you heard, you know, she, she made it clear right there that, you know, just keep this stuff notated because as we've seen in the past, these things rise up. And, you know, like the information we have about the Maidan Square situation or in Syria yeah. about to happen again, you know, it's usually out there somewhere. So pay attention. And as we see this develop, we'll have Vanessa back on and break it down. So thank you for being here. And yeah, as always, everybody out there, question everything. Come to your own mm -hmm. conclusions. Stay vigilant.